I tell you, let's do this. Let's, I want to start at the end of the book. We, a, lot, a lot of times we learn a lot from the very beginning of the book about, the, about what's getting ready to happen. I think Hebrews, you've got to start at the end to see that. Somebody read Hebrews 3, no, 13, Hebrews 13, 10 through 14, please. <clears throat> All right, the Hebrew Christians were Christians in the city of Jerusalem, and throughout this letter, you're going to see references to the temple, to the tabernacle, to the sacrifices, and you will notice here in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse, um, well, really verses 10 and 11, there were those who were, when this letter was written, who were serving the tabernacle. The bodies of the beasts and the blood is brought into the sanctuary. It's burned with outside the camp. Judaism was still being practiced when this letter was written. Um, verse 14, I think, is key. For here we have no continuing city. What might that mean in reference to the city of Jerusalem? Hmm? No. There you go. Here, we have no continuing city. Jerusalem is about to be destroyed. And I think the book of Hebrews was written just prior to that because he tells them, we need to go outside the city uh, where Jesus was sacrificed. Now, why would disciples of Jesus go outside of Jerusalem? before it was destroyed. Because they were told to get out. I actually talked about that a bit on the, my live stream this morning. Uh, they knew it was coming. When you see the armies surrounding the temple, or surrounding the city, and standing where they ought not in the holy place, what do you tell them to do? Flee. Flee Judea. If you're outside the city, he said, don't go back in. If, he said, if you're pregnant or nursing children, it's going to be hard. And you better pray it's not in the wintertime. Because that would make it even worse. I think the book of Hebrews was written to those people in the city of Jerusalem just prior to its destruction. I think there are other things in this text that will kind of lay that out um, as we go through. But I wanted to start there. Because, all right, now we know who it's written to. Christians in Jerusalem. Approximately when, just prior to A.D. 70, it seems to me, Jerusalem didn't just fall in A.D. 70. I mean, it did. But the Roman siege of Jerusalem started in 67. It took over three years for this to all, you know, come to an end, let's say. It didn't just happen one day in Jerusalem and then it's over and the temple's destroyed and it's all done. So we need to understand that. They could see it coming. Remember Jesus there, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. These signs, what were the signs that indicated Jerusalem was about to be destroyed? Or the, the times around the, when Jerusalem would be destroyed? Do you remember the signs that Jesus talked about, anybody? Hmm? Okay, the abomination of desolation, wars and rumors of wars. What else? Okay, where there's smoke, there's fire, you might say. Earthquakes in various places, famines, pestilence. The point is, the evidences of Jerusalem's downfall would be all around them and they could see it. Um, and that seems to be the indication there at the end of chapter 13. Now, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. The, you know, the general consensus... I don't even know if that's the right way to say it, because it's not a consensus. 
A lot of people think Paul wrote it. I don't think he did. There's no indication that he did. And he says in 2 Thessalonians 3 that he signed every letter he wrote, and we have no signature on this letter. I don't think Paul wrote it. It doesn't matter who wrote it, but, you know, to, and I've done it myself, you know, preaching from Hebrews, I'll say, well, Paul wrote in Hebrews. Well, anyway, we know when it was written. We know to whom it was written. Now we know why it was written. Judaism, Judaism had already been taken out of the way. What, was it, what did that process look like? How, what, what was it that brought the Jewish economy to an end? When did the law of Moses come to an end? You guys know this. Come on. At the cross. He nailed it to his cross. He made an open spectacle of it. Uh, Ephesians 2, 14 and 15. Colossians 2. It came to an end. And and it's not just that we're told that in the New Testament. The Old Testament itself told us that there's a different covenant coming, doesn't it? So, and by the way, that passage is even quoted in the book of Hebrews. So the letter, this letter is all about Jesus and his New Testament, his new covenant. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. All right, so look at this passage here. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, a variety of times and in a lot of different ways, spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. You know, you think of all the Old Testament prophets and the many different ways he revealed his will to them, dreams and visions, um, uh, signs, all, all manner of ways God communicated hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. We spent some, we've spent the last two weeks in our young adult class talking about this phrase, the last days. So I want an answer from one of you. What are the last days, young adults? Right now. Young adults. <laughs> We're in it. Brother, Brother Pace is right. Colin is right. We're in it. It's, it was prophesied in the Old Testament, and, and the author says... In these last days, he has spoken unto us by his son. It has happened and it's ongoing. God has revealed himself through his son. But then notice the description of Jesus, because this kind of lays out the rest of the book in Jesus' superiority. Whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. Think, okay, that phrase right there in verse 3. When he himself had purged our sins. What role with that phrase does Jesus play? Who offers the sacrifice? The priest. He's our high priest. All right, so he's, he's a prophet, verse 2. God has spoken to us through him. He's a priest because he has purged us from our sins and he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. What does that make him? He's prophet, priest, and king. Acts chapter 2 tells us that God has exalted him to his right hand. Acts, I think that's Acts 2 and verse 31. Okay? So the, the book lays out the case. Jesus is our prophet, he's our priest, and he's our king. And being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent ministry than they. So, better is the key word to the book of Hebrews. I give you all the verses where this word better is used in Hebrews. The Greek word means to be different and to excel in comparison. He's different from the angels. Jesus is not an angel. And so he's different, but he also excels them. He has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Well, he's God's son. He is a member of, the, the, as we say, the Godhead, Godhood. Angels are not Godhood. They don't possess the qualities of the divine. They are spirit beings. But what, what the rest of Hebrews chapter 1 lays out, and we'll get into chapter 2, but what the rest of Hebrews 1 lays out is basically his role as compared to theirs in, in God's overall work. For unto which of the angels said he, God, at any time? Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Well, the question answers itself. God never said that to any angel. He only said that to one. 
So what I do in the, and you guys know this, what I do in the margin of my Bibles, uh, Bible, is like the, the Bible I've got right here is, a, is laid out each verse. And it's in paragraph form. So by each verse that's a reference to the Old Testament, I write out the reference to the Old Testament. So like verse uh, 5 is a quote of Psalm 2, 7 and 2 Samuel 7, 14. Verse 6 is Psalm 89, 27 and Psalm 97. It's just, he, it's like a bullet point of Old Testament verses that prove that Jesus is more, more better, more excellent, better than the angels. And again, that's not, that's nothing derogatory toward the angels. It's just Christ excels them when compared to them. So all throughout chapter 1, that um, excellence above them is pointed out. And then you get down to Hebrews 1 and verse 14. Somebody read that. Okay, who are ministering spirits? The angels, okay? Uh, then you get into chapter 2. Chapter 1, Jesus is superior to the angels. Therefore, chapter 2, all right? So since that is the case, here's what we need to know. We ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Well, where have we heard them from? What does verse 2 say? I'm, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 2. God has spoken unto us how? By His Son in these last days. So we need to pay close attention to that. He's superior to the angels, so we need to listen to what He had to say. And then He says, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, that's a reference to your Old Testament. Uh, we're told in the book of Hebrews, and I forget, I can't think of the passage right now, but the, uh, and also I think it's in Galatians 3, that the, in some way, the law of Moses, the old covenant, was delivered by angels. I don't know how, we're, that's not precisely laid out for us, but that's what it says. But God has spoken to us by His Son, but not only has He spoken to us by His Son, look at Hebrews 2, 4, and somebody read that. Okay, so he spoke, but then he confirmed the spoken word. That's the purpose of miracles. And uh, so we need to pay close attention to what was said. And that's verse, what he said there in verse 1. So then it goes on to, to further compare, you might say, Jesus with the angels. Jesus is the one who took on flesh. Hebrews 2 and verse 9, he tasted death for every man. No angel did that. No angel, you get down to verse um, uh, Hebrews 2, 16. For verily he took not on the nature of angels... But he took on him the seed of Abraham. Uh, well, again, no angel did that. Only the Son of God did that. And it, right. He doesn't aid the angels, he aids us. And that's why he had to take on flesh. He had to become like us so that he could be, as he'll say later in the book, our faithful high priest. Uh, because he, well, then verse 18 there, he's suffered just like you and I suffer. He's endured the same things. And so, therefore, he he understands he can be our, he's qualified, therefore, to be our high priest. So he's better than the angels, chapters one and two. And I've got these bullet points down here. Um. That which excels. But any questions on chapters 1 and 2? Okay. Chapters 3 and 4, Jesus' rest is greater than the rest that was offered by Moses and Joshua to Israel. And so uh, the, the illustrations are taken. And again, it's just like bullet point after bullet point of Old Testament passage proving they could have entered a rest. They didn't enter a rest because of unbelief. They heard the gospel preached, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, but they didn't mix it with faith, so it didn't benefit them. There's something to think about there. You know, you can hear the gospel all day long, but if you don't put it into action, what good is it? 
read your Bible all day long. If you don't put it into action, what good is it? It's not a bit of good to you. And that's exactly what Israel's problem was. So that goes down through chapter 4 and verse 13, that the rest Jesus offers is, it, it excels the rest that was offered to Israel in the promised land, which, incidentally, they missed that entire generation. Um, let's see here. Somebody read Hebrews 4 and verse 11. There are good examples from the Old Testament, but there are bad examples too. You know, every example is, is just that. Every example is an example. Some are good, some are bad. Well, Israel, on their way to the, uh, to the promised land, don't be like them. That's his point there in chapters, cha really chapter 3, 1, as I put in your outline here, down through chapter 4 and verse 13, because as you get to chapter 4 and verse 14, he switches topics, and not like a major shift because it's still dealing with Israel, but now we go from the rest to the, to the priesthood. Hebrews 4 and verse 14. We have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens. And so from chapter 4, and this is broken up a bit in the text, chapter 4, 14, through chapter 5 and verse 11, and then from chapter 5, verse 12, down through chapter 6, he has a very personal um, exhortation, rebuke, however you want to say it, to them, but then in chapter 6 and verse 13, he gets right back to Christ's priesthood, priesthood. And what priests is Jesus compared to in these chapters? Melchizedek and Aaron, the Levitical priesthood, that whole system, let's say, of priests and their role. Well, as with the angels and as with his rest, Jesus is a superior priest. What makes him a superior priest? All right, what did a, if a high priest was going to enter into the most holy place, which he could only do once a year, what was the first thing he had to do before he could do that? What did he have to offer first? He had to cleanse himself first. And then he could go in and offer sacrifice for the people. Uh, what about Jesus? What's the distinction? He didn't have to go in and offer first. He was pure. He was perfect. And so that's pointed out in this book, or, or in these chapters, rather. Um, a distinction made between the priesthoods is the source, all right? So the Aaronic or the Levitical priesthood, that was the one authorized and the only one authorized by God. Well, from what tribe did, Ju did from what tribe did Jesus arise? Somebody give me a wrong answer first. <laughs> tribe of Judah. Yeah. Of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. He tells us that in uh, chapter seven, verse fourteen. So that's one of those passages we talk about the silence of scriptures. But God really wasn't silent on the priesthood, was he? Was he? He was very specific. He spoke about the priesthood. And when he spoke about Levi, he didn't have to say, hey, I don't want Judah in there or Dan or Asher. When he said Levi, that was it. He didn't have to say anything else. And that's the nature of God's authority. <clears throat> when he tells you to do something, you do it. And you do it the way he says do it. So that's like I, like I have here in your outline, chapters 4, 5. It covers chapters 6, 7, and 8. Melchizedek's an interesting character because we don't read, the, the only place we read of him is in Genesis chapter 14, and it's just a very few verses when he encounters Abraham. But he was the priest of Salem and priest of the Most High God. That's all we're told. Now the Levites, they could trace their priesthood and they had to. But Melchizedek, we just, here he is in biblical history and then he's gone and he's not mentioned again until you get to the pages of the New Testament. Any questions or comments on all of that? And that's, you look at the first few verses of Hebrews chapter 7, uh, as it's talking about priest, uh, about Melchizedek. He didn't have a father without mother, without descent, neither beginning of days nor end of life. Well, that's not literal. 
He had to have a mother and a father, and he had to have a beginning point and an end point. It's just saying there's no record of it. The Levites, they kept record. They knew. They knew their... They were even under, under David. David organized all this before the temple was even constructed. They had courses that they served. It was like divided up specifically. Um, Melchizedek, we just don't know anything about other than what's told us here. Any questions on any of that? Chapter, again, and that continues into chapter 8. And somebody read chapter 8 and verse 6. All right, excellent, better, better. That verse is kind of like a highlight of the book or a climax of the book because it's, it's so emphatic. Um, a more excellent ministry, better covenant, better promises. There are actually people, I read an article, this has been several months ago, within churches of Christ that say the New Testament never talks about the Old Testament. Never talks about two different covenants. They say, that this one article I was reading says that the Old Covenant is... Or rather that the new, te what we call the New Testament is how he phrased it. What we call the New Testament is nothing more than a renewed old covenant. Hmm. Then where's our Levitical priesthood? And Where's the tabernacle? And where are all these services? That's a silly argument. N number one, the Old Testament is so called the Old Testament. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And if there's a, so let's do it this way. If there's a first covenant, what does that imply? There's a second. Okay? If there's a second covenant, that implies that there was one before it. And we actually get into that in Hebrews chapter, really chapters 9 and 10. There was a first and there was a second. There was an earthly tabernacle. There's a tabernacle that is not of this earth. And that's in chapter 9 as well. So anyway, uh, Jesus' priesthood is, it excels over Melchizedek's and the Levitical. Uh, Jesus' covenant, is it, it excels over the Mosaic covenant, and that's Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 through 13. But look at verse 13 here. Somebody read Hebrews 8, 13 for us. Okay. It's obsolete... The New King James says, um, the first old, the, the King James says, that means that what that word means is that it's, it, it has been made old. It's in, a, in, the, it's in the perfect tense in the, old, in, in the Greek language. It's, it's been done. But then he goes on to say, that which is becoming or decaying and waxing old, growing old, is ready to vanish away. So he says on one hand, it's, it's obsolete, but on the other hand, it's ready to vanish away. Why does he say that? We talked about it at the very beginning of class. The, yeah, at this point in time, it was, the temple was still there, and the animals were still being sacrificed, and the blood was still being shed. That's Hebrews 13, 10 through 12. So it has been made obsolete by God, but you still have the Jews who are following it. Um, God doesn't have two covenants running together at the same time. They run independently of each other. And so that's part of the problem that the Hebrews were dealing with. These are Hebrew Christians. They're Jews. They're, that's where they came from. And so they live in the city of Jerusalem where the temple's still standing and sacrifices are still being offered. And you know that they have temptation to come back to Judaism. I mean, that's the whole point of this book. And so, while it was nailed to the cross, as we already said, the, the functions, let's say it that way, the functions of the Levitical priesthood and all that were still ongoing. Uh, question or comments? No, when the temple was destroyed... That kind of eradicated that whole system of record keeping.
Hebrews 9, Jesus' tabernacle, which is the church, is over the first and its services. Notice here in Hebrews chapter 9, uh, somebody read verse 10, please. Okay. It's talking about the services under the first tabernacle, and he calls it fleshly. King James says carnal ordinances, the washings and all the procedures that they had to go through in the process of um, sanctifying the temple, uh, cleansing the instruments, all of that stuff. That stuff was carnal. It was fleshly, physical services. Those things were imposed until the time of Reformation. And if you want to know what the time of Reformation is, you read Acts chapter 3. Because Peter tells us that from Samuel and all the prophets have spoken of these days, the days of Reformation. It's the New Testament. It's the last days as Hebrews 1 opens up. Well, that first covenant, look at Hebrews 9 and verse 9, was a figure it foreshadowed what was going to come ultimately in Christ. It was carnal. It was fleshly. All those services. And the church is not like that. So that's the, uh, that's the point of Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 verses 1 to 22. Jesus' blood is excellent over the animal's blood that had been offered. It's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Well, that, that could only be accomplished through the blood of Jesus. And uh, there in Hebrews 9, which we just left, but in Hebrews 9, you look at verse 15, it says that by means of Jesus' death, the transgressions that were under the first covenant were even forgiven. If you were a faithful Jew under Judaism and you were following the law of Moses, you know, say 500 years before Jesus came, and you, you were faithful to the law, you were right with God. And the blood of Jesus covered you. You know, Jesus, we're told, he was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, according to the book of Revelation. That plan, the, the, the plan of redemption, was in the mind of God throughout all eternity. And so, Jesus' blood, as we say, flowed in both directions. It flowed before the cross, and it flows to us today after the cross. Animal sacrifice couldn't do that. Uh, so that's Hebrews 10, 1 through 22. And then Hebrews 12, 18 through 29, the heavenly Jerusalem, which is the church, is excellent, is better than the physical Jerusalem where they were living at that point in time. And remember, here we have no continuing city. Hebrews 13, verse 14, it's going to be destroyed, but the church will never be destroyed. We are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Hebrews 12 and verse 28. Jerusalem is going to be shaken here shortly. The church never will be. So that's all your, that, that's your, those are your bullet points for the better aspect of Hebrews. But throughout that, there are like personal, let's say personal applications for the Hebrews. And that's what I have at the end of the outline here. If you have any questions or comments, though, on anything we've already said? All right. Well, chapter 5, verses 12, chapter 5, verse 12 through chapter 6, verse 12 is a very... Um, pointed rebuke to the Christians, to the Hebrew Christians, because for when for the time you ought to be teachers, what was the problem? What did they have need of? You, we got to start all over with you. The very fundamentals. You're unskilled in the word of righteousness, verse 13. And so you then get into chapter 6, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ... Let us go on unto perfection. Why would we leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ? Well, if you look at a New King James, it translates that Greek word a little better. The elementary principles. If you're still stuck in Judaism, you're in the elementary stage. You need to move on to perfection. You need to grow up. Is, you know, essentially what he tells them there. And so, uh, well, that's what you do in Christ. So that goes down on through chapter 6 and verse 12. And you notice chapter 6 and verse 9, 
He rebukes them sharply, but then you get to chapter 6 and verse 9, and he says, I know you guys can do better. I'm confident that of better things from you. And, you know, that's true for every one of us, isn't it? We can do better than we do. And uh, we, I suppose we all need to hear that sometimes. Uh, chapter 10, let's go there real quick. Verses 23 through 29, or rather 39, a warning that they should not draw back unto perdition. What was the Hebrews 10, 25? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Uh, I've told you that that verse has been used in such a wrong way for so long. There is no way that we can parallel, let, let me say it like this, Judaism, that existed by the will of God, didn't it? Didn't it? Judaism, the law of Moses? Okay. Man, rough crowd tonight. Judaism existed by the will of God. But it was, again, taken out of the way, nailed to the cross. Jesus triumphed over it. He was the end of the law, Romans chapter 10 and verse 4. They're being tempted to leave the church to go back into Judaism, which if you were still a practicing Jew, you could have said, well, this is the law from God. This law came from Sinai. Some of these Christians, as the habit of some is, were forsaking the church. That doesn't mean they were missing a Wednesday night service. That's how we use it, though. But that's not what he was saying. The word forsake means to abandon. They were abandoning the assembly. They were leaving the church to go back under Judaism. That's what he's condemning here. And we have misused that verse, myself included, in the past. Um, you know, the Bible was not written to me, and it was not written to you. You didn't live in Jerusalem in the first century, did you? So we need to learn how to... Th this is what Paul means when he says in 2 Timothy 2, rightly divide the word of truth. You better handle it correctly, because as Hebrews says, it's, a, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. You better handle it correctly. That's why James warns, you know, don't be many teachers, because you're going to receive a stricter judgment. You better be careful how you handle the Bible. These Christians were being warned. Well, uh, 1023, you've got to hold fast. You've got to hold on. And, well, this is what that looks like. You don't want to sin willfully, verse 26. If you do, you're looking for fearful judgment, verse 27. And then he calls to remembrance their former days, verse 30, Hebrews 10, verse 32. When you were first converted, remember what that was like. Because now you've kind of, uh, well, he says it in chapter 12, um, Hebrews 12, and verse 5, you have forgotten the exhortation. They had left so much behind. And uh, he's, he's trying to get them to, you know, pull yourself together, basically. Stop forsaking the church to go back to Judaism. We can't duplicate that today. You, you know, per, a person can leave the church today to go back into the world, yes. But the world and its lifestyle is not a God-approved manner of living. Judaism was, and they were being pulled in two directions, you might say. So Hebrews 10.39, we are not of those who draw back unto perdition, but who believe to the saving of the soul, is an introduction to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 says, this is what it means to believe to the saving of the soul. You live by faith. And, uh, you know, all those Old Testament examples show that. And then chapter 12, of course, we are surround, you know, we're surrounded by that great crowd of witnesses. We need to lay, lay aside anything that will hold us back and run the race that is set before us. That's what they were not doing. They were leaving the church to go back under Judaism. Uh, and then chapter 13, there's a special emphasis to me in that chapter, three different times on the elders of the church. Verse 7, verse 17, and verse 24. Remember those who rule over you, verse 7. Uh, obey them who rule over you and submit yourselves, verse 17. And then verse 24, salute all those that are over you and all the saints. You know, greet them for us. So you have a, an emphasis there on the eldership of this congregation in Jerusalem. Any questions or comments on any of this? Approximately 35 years. I think that's a safe estimate. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, the law of Moses was a 1,500-year-old system. These folks, you know, some of them have been Christians perhaps the whole time since the beginning, you know, there in Acts 2. Uh, not only would old habits die hard, but um, maybe some of them, maybe some of them had the attitude of, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You know, we're just full of our metaphors here tonight. Uh, Sure, there's no doubt that they knew the Old Testament prophecies. Well, the, the problem, part of the problem was they were looking for the wrong thing. They, yeah, they wanted a political movement. Exactly. Mm. And even Peter, James, and John, this inner circle of things. Yep. Two weeks ahead of him going, setting his mind to go to Jerusalem, still didn't get it. Right. We're still thinking that the earth is finished. Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Yeah, Acts 1 6. Isn't it good that we're not that way? You know, that we don't already have in our minds the way things ought to be. Yeah. <laughs> All right.